I'm Mark Brace, and welcome to my Curious Podcast, where in each episode I look at a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, I'll be investigating the real secret origin of arguably Wales's most famous folktale, and that is the story of the heroic hound called Gellert, the story of Beard Gellert, a fairy tale of sorts that has so many magical elements to it, as well as so much commercial potential that I'm surprised Disney haven't already made a a two-hour animated version of it. It's got the valiant dog, the hero of the story. It's got a snarling enemy that the dog must overcome. And it's got a prince that, well, I I won't spoil the story for you quite yet. We'll have the whole story very soon. But I should point out very quickly before we begin the story that, as a rule, I don't generally talk about the obvious stories on this podcast. The whole point is to go in search of obscure, long-lost, unknown stories. But one thing came to light recently with the story of Beth Gellert. And that is, I first heard this story when I was very, very young in Welsh language education, Welsh language school. And I grew up assuming that everyone knew this story. This story was as well known to me as Snow White or Cinderella or other fairy tales are to other children. But I I realised in the last year or so, I've been doing um, various media appearances on, on, on other podcasts and radio and TV and things. And one of the stories I get asked about the most is the story of Beth Gallet. And what I've come to realise is that while this story is very well known to me, to people outside of Wales, or even to those inside of Wales who maybe don't speak Welsh, it is not such a well-known story. And also importantly, is that even those who do know the story might not be familiar with where it really came from. And the truth, I think, is is almost as interesting as the, the fantastical story. Now, before I tell you the story, we should take a quick look at the name itself, Bev Gellert, which is one word, B-E-D-D, or th in Welsh, G-E-L-E-R-T, Bev Gellert. And it is the name of a village, a a beautiful little hamlet in Gwynedd, in the north of Wales, and it can be found in the shadow of some of the incredible mountains in Snowdonia National Park. Snowdonia, it's it's world famous for its mountains, and there, sitting beneath these towering mountains, is the little village of Beth Gallet. Now, the word Beth Gallet is a combination of two words, the word Beth and the word Gallet. Beth is Welsh for grave. Gallet is assumed to be the name Gellert. We'll come back to that later as to why that may or may not be the case, but for now, those two words combine to mean Gellert's grave. Beth Gellert means Gellert's grave. And this name, it is said, refers to the heroic dog who once lived in the area known as Gellert. And Anyone who has been lucky enough to visit this area will know all about this dog. He really is quite the local celebrity. There's a wonderful sculpture, a life-size sculpture of the dog. Well, I, <laughs> I say life-size. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming it's life-size. I have, I have no idea how, how big uh, Gellert would have been if, if Gellert existed. But he was thought to be an Irish wolfhound. And this the statue certainly looks about the right size for an Irish wolfhound. And this statue of an Irish wolfhound can be found quite close to a national trust marker that points the way to Gellert's grave. And I don't mean as in the village of Beth Gellert. I mean literally a grave 
which is dedicated to Gellert. Now, this is in a... It's a beautiful spot. In, in, in a beautiful village. I, I might overuse the word beautiful in this podcast when I talk about Beth Gellert, but it, it, it really is. If I... If I was being paid by the tourist board to promote somewhere, I think Bath Gallet would be one of my one of my top places to promote. But there's this wonderful spot which has a uh, a couple of trees which are fenced off. There's a circular fence, a small fence around them, and within that fence, at the foot of these trees, is a large stone, a monument to Gallet, and in front of that monument are two tombstones, both of which tell the story of Gellert's heroic antics. One is written in the English language and the other is written in Cymraeg, in Welsh. And I will now read to you the story of Gellert as inscribed on Gellert's tombstone in Beth Gellert. <clears throat> I would normally cut out those those coughing noises in the edit. But in this case, I hope it will add to the dramatic effect <laughs> that I'm trying to establish, because I am about to tell you a story. And so, if you're sitting comfortably, <clears throat> I shall begin. In the 13th century, Llewellyn, Prince of North Wales, had a palace at Beth Gellert. One day he went hunting without Gellert, the faithful hound, who was unaccountably absent. On Llewellyn's return, the truant, stained and smeared with blood, joyfully sprang to meet his master. The prince, alarmed, hastened to find his son and saw the infant's cot empty the bedclothes and floor covered with blood. The frantic father plunged his sword into the hound's side, thinking it had killed his heir. The dog's dying yell was answered by a child's cry. Llewellyn searched and discovered his boy unharmed. But nearby lay the body of a mighty wolf which Gellert had slain. The prince, filled with remorse, is said never to have smiled again. He buried Gellert here. And that is the end of the tale as it is related on the tombstone. Now, another way of telling the story in a, in a less flowery way, shall we say, is that Prince Llewellyn the Great went hunting and he left his dog in charge of his son and heir at home. When he returned home and found his dog sitting there, covered in blood amongst all the wreckage, all the furniture tipped upside down, he assumed the dog had gone wild. The dog had lost its mind, trashed the house, but worst of all, his son was nowhere to be seen, but his cot lay there on the ground, empty and smeared with blood, just like the paws and the dripping mouth of the dog. Now, he put two and two together and assumed the worst. He assumed the dog must have killed his son, and with that, he pierced the dog with his sword. And as we heard in the last version, the last telling, that dog's dying cry was met with the cry of a very much alive baby boy. And when Llewellyn went looking for that boy, he also found alongside him the body of a giant wolf which Gellert had slain. Now, as an aftermath to this story, it was said that Llewellyn was so eaten up with grief afterwards for killing what really was man's best friend. And as a result, he moped for the rest of his life, leaving this monument to Gellert underneath the tree. Now, that is a very tragic story. It does not have 
a happy ending. But like all good fairy tales, there is always a glimmer of hope. And I do have some good news for dog lovers. You can dry dry your eyes and wipe away the tears because it is almost certainly not true. It is almost certainly rubbish. And what I mean by that is that story is thought to be a work of fiction. There was probably no heroic dog called Gallat, and if there was a dog called Gallat, he probably was not as heroic as that story makes him out to be. He was not killed by Prince Llewellyn, and the whole thing was just made up. Or was it? If this was just the figment of somebody's imagination, why did they invent it? What purpose would they have for it? And why did everyone believe it? Well, first of all, we have to bear in mind that very similar stories, what are known as heroic dog stories or heroic hound stories, could be found all across Europe. There is a very similar story in Germany and in France and in, in, in other countries where the names might change. There's, there's no there's no Llewellyn in, in Germany and there's no Gellert in France. Uh, but pretty much the mechanics of the story in where a dog is slain mistakenly is repeated again and again. So it could be said that this story has simply been lifted from some other some other country, some other culture, and repackaged in Wales. And if that is the case, it might well explain where the idea for the story initially came from, but it doesn't really explain how it became such an enduring legend, such a part of the culture that it's still going strong today. Well, we're going to have a very quick history lesson here and head back to the late 18th century and into the early 19th century when, for the first time, Wales became a tourist destination. People from across the border in England were visiting Wales as were presumably some some people from Scotland and maybe further away. And the reason for that is up until this point, those who could afford to go on holidays were looking across the channel at mainland Europe. They wanted to go on their grand tours. They were thinking Paris or Rome, not Newport or Cardiff. But this all changed following the outbreak of the French Revolution. All of a sudden, popping on a boat and sailing towards France, sailing towards a war-torn country, wasn't quite as appealing to the aristocracy or, or for those with money with which to travel, who were not too keen on potentially losing their heads on holiday. And as such, they began to look closer to home in search of an alternative destination. And it just so happened that there was this big lump of unexplored land stuck to the side of England. A land which George Borrow, a well-travelled Englishman who wrote quite extensively about his journeys and had a real fondness for for Wales and the people of Wales and the, the culture and the language of Wales, described as Wild Wales. Wild Wales was now open for business. It was open for tourism business. And one of the best ways for us nowadays to experience the awe that it must have inspired in visitors at the time is through the eyes of the romantic poets and painters who visited and captured Wales in their paintings and their poems. The most famous works, I imagine, would be those by J.M.W. Turner, uh, arguably England's greatest painter, who did capture many of the castles and landscapes during his tours of Wales. And possibly the most famous man of words to compose verse 
during this period would be William Wordsworth, whose famous poem, Tintin Abbey, is named after a supposedly haunted Welsh landmark, which will feature in another podcast very soon. And so inspired was he by the landscape that as he walked around the Wye Valley, it is said, this poem formed complete in his head before he even had a chance to sit down and put pen to paper. This is the impact that Wild Wales, this sublime, undiscovered country, was having on people who were now exploring it for the first time. Now, from our point of view, from a a folkloric point of view, this also led to the establishment, or or certainly the popularisation then, of what we now consider to be important parts of Welsh cultural identity. A good example of this might be the Welsh costume, which is, which is quite a well-known image now, but if, if you aren't familiar with it, I'd, I'd recommend having a quick internet image search after this podcast. But the Welsh costume became something which tourists expected to see when they visited. They expected to see their locals dressed up in this costume that they believed people were wearing nine to five all the time every day. Um, and as such, this image stuck. Now, it, it's mainly the the female costume that we know nowadays. There was a male costume, but it's pretty much the traditional Welsh ladies costume with a tall hat, which ha- has also become synonymous with the popular image of a witch. Uh, and that is something I will be looking at in a future episode about the um, the real history of the Welsh costume and any connections it has with witchiness, if, if there are any connections. Um, but that was one example of what tourists expected when they came to Wild Wales. And if you were something of an entrepreneur, you could use this expectation to your advantage. And I think the best example of this, certainly the most ingenious example, is the invention of the longest place name in Europe and the second longest place name in the entire world, which is a a crazy 58 letters long. And despite being a Welsh speaker, I am Ashamed to admit that I have never memorised this, but what the heck? Um, Let's do it in one take. The full name of the longest place name in Europe is Llanfarpwchwingell Gugerch Windrobeth Llandesilio Gugugoch. And and while I'm almost certain that that was not perfect, um, I I did say one take, and that was my one take, across my heart. Um, and what I'll do, I'll spell that for you as well, just in case you did fancy uh, memorising this and giving it a go yourself. And that is spelt uh, double L, which is in Welsh, but double L, A-N-F-A-I-R-P-W, double L, G-W-Y-N-G-Y, double L, or G-O-G-E-R-Y-C-H, or in Welsh, W-Y-R-N-D-R-O-B, W, yes, double, quadruple L, A N T Y S I L I O G O G O G O C H. Now, I hope you were paying very close attention then, because I will not be repeating that, and there will be a test on your pronunciation at the end of this episode. But why did they invent such a an incredibly long name in the first place, besides to twist the tongues of of podcasters like me in in centuries to come. Well, it's all thanks to tourism again. And the idea was people would travel to this village simply to see this, this humongous train station sign as they arrived. Later on, people would also have photographs with it, and it worked. People did visit just to see this long sign. Now, the reason I'm talking about these things, the reason I'm going on about Llanfair and and going on about the Welsh costume in Wild Wales, is that these things were put in place to attract the tourists. And with all of Wales competing for the same number of people who, who all had limited amounts of money to spend, they had to try and stand out. And one 
great way of standing out is to have a legend, a famous real life legend attached to your village. And that is exactly what they had in Beth Gellert. A legend so famous that William Robert Spencer, the poet, would compose verse about it and Haydn, one of the most famous composers ever, would set to music. This is a big legend. Although I am at the same time somewhat surprised that a place as beautiful as Beth Gellert would need to go down this route in the first place. Because while I didn't see it in the 18th century, I'm assuming it looked just as spectacular, if not even more spectacular back then than it does now. Or even if it looked half as good as it does now, it would still attract the tourists without the need to invent some myth or legend to attach to the village. Nevertheless, it is claimed that the story of Gallat was popularised right around this time in order to attract the tourists. But if you've been paying attention to this podcast, you will, of course, remember that there is a monument to Gallat in Beth Gallat. There are two tombstones with Gellert's name on the top in Beth Gellert, all of which leads us to believe that there is a body buried underneath all of this, which people pay their respects to. Sadly, this is also untrue. It is said that that memorial was placed there by a man called David Pritchard. Why would David Pritchard want to put a memorial to a dog that never existed in Beth Gallet? Well, David Pritchard was the landlord of a pub called the Royal Goat Inn at the end of the 18th century. If we were being cynical about it, we could say maybe David Pritchard wanted to drum up more trade for Beth Gallet, which meant more people buying pints in the Royal Goat Inn. And so we could say this story was helped along by a man trying to sell a few extra pints. And if that is true, then I think we have to tick our hat off to him because this marketing idea is still going strong centuries afterwards. And if anything, is is becoming more popular rather than less popular. So David Pritchard, if indeed it was you, thank you. For, for establishing this, this incredible landmark. But it doesn't end there. Because if that hasn't spoiled the story enough for you already, there is yet another twist in the tale. And we're going to go back to the 7th century, where a hermit was living in a cave, which in the Middle Ages became known as as the holy well of St. Keller. Pilgrims would flock there because this holy well would offer, would heal them. The water from the well would heal them. The well of St. Keller. Now, let, let, let's look at that name a little bit more, shall we? Because St. Keller is a variation of Kellet, and Kellet in Welsh is Gellert. And so, wandering around 7th century Wales, centuries before enterprising landlords came along, there was a saint who lent his name to various locations throughout the country. Now, that would make sense if there was a place called Beth Gellert, that it could be the grave of a 7th century saint who by all accounts was martyred, and then it's possible he was buried near a wonderful little hamlet in Gwynedd. And it became known as the Beth Gellert that we know and love today. Now, we've reached the point of the podcast where I like to ask what you think about this. Are you familiar with Beth Gellert? 
Do you think there's more to this story that, than we've discussed on this episode? And if so, please, please, please get in touch, drop me an email, track me down on social media, and maybe we can look at it in a future episode. And of course, there's the obligatory shout out in every episode that if you have enjoyed this, please consider hitting the subscribe button. I really appreciate it because that way I know I'm not sitting here talking to myself. And it also means you get an alert popping up letting you know whenever there's a new episode available. All of which leaves me to say that if you were not familiar with the story of Gellert beforehand, I hope you've enjoyed that dose of Welsh folklore and maybe it has inspired you to pay a visit to the village itself at some point in the future. If you were familiar with the story of Gellert beforehand, I hope you've enjoyed learning maybe some new details about it and I hope it hasn't destroyed any cherished childhood memories you might have had of this dog which may or may not be real because let us not forget while these theories are flying about they are just that theories who can really say if Gallat did or did not exist if Gallat did or did not fight off a snarling wolf and save the life of the child of Prince Llewellyn. And if we choose to believe this story is true, then we can all pay our respects to that heroic dog at the site of Gellert's grave in Beth Gellert. Thank you very much. Dioch and Var Yawn, no star.